Hello and welcome to Roundtable. Just how many Afghan migrants will there be now that the Taliban has control of the country once more? And who in Europe will take them? A few thousand there, a few thousand here, when the United Nations says more than half a million people have been internally displaced this year alone. It could be that many will be left with nowhere to go. Very good to have you along. I'm David Foster. Countries face a balancing act, a moral, humanitarian duty to help, and a need, some would say, not to alienate voters when migration has become such a divisive issue. <laughs> Afghan refugees are scrambling to flee Afghanistan after the Taliban takeover of the country. European leaders fear a repeat of the 2015 refugee crisis, when more than one million refugees sought asylum in Europe. The UK is to take 20,000 Afghan refugees, it says, over five years. Germany could grant asylum to about 10,000 Afghans. According to the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, this resettlement of vulnerable people is of utmost importance. It is our moral duty. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, had this to say. Afghanistan's destabilization risks causing irregular migration to Europe. France, as I've said, has and will continue to do its duty for those who are most threatened. We will do our full part in an organized and fair international effort. But Afghanistan also needs, in times to come, to mobilize their forces. Europe cannot be the only ones to take on consequences of the current situation. Austria's Chancellor Sebastian Kurz says he is against Austria accepting any additional refugees. So how prepared is Europe for an Afghan refugee influx? Let us go first of all to Washington DC and there we see Ahmed Shah Mahibi, founder of Rise to Peace, who still has family in Kabul then to Northamptonshire in the United Kingdom, and we welcome Gulwali Pasale, former refugee and author of The Lightless Sky, an Afghan refugee boy's journey of escape to a new life in Britain and in London. We see Steve Crawshaw. He is a policy and advocacy director at Free From Torture. Uh, Gulwali, we'll come to your personal story a little bit later, if we may, how you were tried by the Taliban to be a recruit to their, their militias. Uh, were you turned them down, you managed to escape. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But one million internally displaced already this year, added to the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, who were already homeless. Can they all be taken somewhere else? Uh, we are not asking everyone to be taken somewhere else. That would be good, but we need Afghans to stay in Afghanistan. I think we need the international community to help and support the humanitarian crisis. There were about five million internally displaced before, um, and there were a lot of retainees as well who are struggling uh, to survive. So I, I feel like, yeah, of course, the, the international community, the UK, the European Union, the US should take as many as they could. I, I suggest up to, you know, a million perhaps, but the rest should be dealt with in Afghanistan and supported there uh, so they can help in rebuild their own countries and, and start, you know, businesses and contribute to the agriculture and whatever other sectors. So yes, in a way, we're not asking take all the 35 million Afghans who are in need of, you know, perhaps in need of support. But what we need to happen is to support people where they are or close to where they are. Very difficult decision on who stays and who goes. Ahmed Shah, let me come to you. I know you believe that it's the duty of Afghans to remain in their country. Very difficult choice. Yes. Uh, I mean, look, we are talking about a 38 million uh, population. And if you were talking about the, the media family and the journalists and the activists and those who help the international community, particularly the United States, look, their life could be in danger. Uh, most, some could be more severe and others could be uh, in the future. But I uh, agreed with uh, you know, our guests that in terms of to, uh, uh, prosperity and stability and long path for Afghanistan, uh, the international community, the United uh, Nations, uh, they should work on some sort of humanitarian capacity to help the broader Afghan community in Afghanistan by creating jobs and building opportunities for them. Sorry, should it only be those whose lives are in danger who are given refuge? Or should it also be those who say, actually, we don't want to live under the Taliban? 
if we're speaking from an international uh, perspective, the laws and, and, the, and the laws of the refugees and asylums, everyone should be able to leave and the Taliban should not be able to stop anyone. But if we're talking about who is eligible and whose life is at high priority risk, then those high priority risk should have been given the, the option to leave. Look, we're speaking right now, there are U.S. citizens, green card holders, HIVs, all allied Canadians, I mean, you name it, they have been stuck in Kabul, Afghanistan, different places, and, the, and, and all these military folks inside the Kabul airport uh, are not able to literally save them. So it has been a chaos, it has been a disaster. I think first what needs to be happen is the United States and all these big countries at the airport right now should work on some sort of evacuation plan, a strategy, a plan that should work, a plan that should <clears throat> isolate people who are eligible and who are people who are not. Look, a lot of these people right now are not off their security, they are off their prosperity. If we give back the same example, the refugees that get, came from Somalia, Turkey, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Turkey, you know, Turkey offered a lot of opportunities for them, even though the Turkey's economy may not be as great as so many other Western countries, but all of them went through the agency and a lot, you know, sadly uh, drowned but we are not after security, you know. OK, and, and, and indeed, we may well security. see many more people trying those dangerous routes to get to Europe somehow. Um, Steve, before I come to you uh, properly, I want to read out something from the, the Belgian migration minister. That's Sami Mahdi. He put this out on Twitter this month. Just because regions of a country are dangerous doesn't mean that every person from that country has the right to protection. What's your thought on that? I mean, technically, that may be correct under the UN Refugee Convention. I think it's a, an extraordinary message for the minister to be sending at this moment. It's a, that sense very much of erecting obstacles rather than opening the doors. And I think at this moment of, of all times, uh, European politicians should be sending a strong signal of sending the, the, the opening of the doors. Um, we're seeing it from different governments. There's the, the obstacles which are either actually being talked about or actually being put in place. The UK, for example, has new legislation which was in preparation already before um, the events of the last few weeks, which basically would be in, in direct breach of the UN Refugee Convention by requiring very particular forms of paperwork to be in place before someone could arrive. In effect, therefore, it would, well, not in effect, it would criminalize people, for example, arriving across the channel. Uh, you, and you, you, yeah, you've called it an anti-refugee law. Yeah, we did, absolutely. So we at Freedom From Torture, and to be honest, most of the other, almost all I would say, of the main refugee organisations in, in the UK have described it as an anti-refugee bill as the way that really gets to the heart of what we're doing. So a very authoritative legal opinion... But, but, but excuse me for interrupting, you cannot hmm. escape the fact the leaders of some countries, well, let's we've mentioned Sebastian Kurz from Austria, is aware that a lot of his people, his voters, don't want more refugees there. Uh, we've had Germany, Austria, Denmark, Belgium, the Netherlands and Greece sign a letter saying we would like to highlight the urgent need to perform returns, not accept refugees, but to send some people back at the moment. How do they delicately work their way out of this balancing act? Yeah, and I think there's two, you raise important points. I think there's a couple of points there. One is what are the voters thinking? And what we've seen uh, in the UK, but not only, and, and you refer to Austria as well, is where you have both the media and certain far-right politicians stoking certain narratives, which are often just simply inaccurate. So if you ask many British people what proportion are being taken by the UK, they will come up with some ludicrously high figure, where actually, of course, the UK and most other European countries are taking a very small proportion. So on the one hand, you have that and those very false narratives which have to be confronted. Germany, I think, is a very interesting example. Certainly, they have tried to be um, careful, but I think Angela Merkel has been really interesting, and other politicians in Germany also, to be fair, of taking a kind of moral stance which says, let us look at this both from the moral perspective, but also from the sense of global stability. If you simply wash your hands and say, this is all somebody else's business, well, your neighbor will also say, well, it's not mine, it's somebody else's business. That cascades down the line, and what you end up with is a way more unstable world than okay. you started. Go back to 1972, one of the first stories I covered as a journalist. 28,000 Ugandan Asians come to Britain. 1979, 12,000 or 13,000 Vietnamese boat people. Um, they were assimilated pretty well. If you take more than 20,000, how do you 
make sure that they integrate into society. Completely agree with Steve what he's saying, and this idea that you want to build walls and uh, stop people in saying it's not your responsibility it doesn't work. It's you know it's a humanitarian crisis. We all need to play our fair share. And when Priti Patel says that we can't take 20,000 in one go, that's not true. There are a lot of goodwill across the UK. People are very generous. People want to help. The UK government can certainly do a lot more. I, I suggest we should take about 100,000 Afghans who are in need of international protection uh, over the next... I mean, this putting a figure, figure out in the time scales is not uh, helpful because, you know, Afghans are in urgent need of uh, protection in, in century. We can't say they had to wait for four or five years. But I think our neighboring countries should open their borders. Uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, and Iran, and uh, the UK and the European Union should allow Afghans to seek uh, asylum or seek uh, humanitarian visas from third countries like Turkey, like India, who so Afghans were not able to get out through the, the evacuation, evacuation process. They should be able to come here, especially if they have you know reasons, family yeah. reunification, to make it easier, to make it simpler. And there are also thousands of Afghans in the UK and also in Europe who are undocumented who have failed asylum seekers because the government have been arguing for years that Afghanistan is safe. These people should be granted refugee status without uh, further delay. Okay, so, so you're advocating at, at least five times as many as the UK says it's going to take in at the moment. I want to go back to your own personal story. And I mentioned at the top of the programme that you um, came across the Taliban when you were 11 or 12 years old. Your father had been killed. The Taliban tried to recruit you. Now, you decided that wasn't something you wanted to do for obvious reasons, and, and you made a long and painful journey across to Britain. What about this idea that people who don't want to stay in Afghanistan might have to? Well, David, you know, I didn't decide I was a kid. Um, things were decided for me by my family. But anyway, that's another story. I wish, you know, I was looking forward to going home. I've not seen my mother and my family for the last 15 years. I recently became British citizen, so I was very hopeful to go back and play a positive role using my education. But, you know, we are heartbroken what we have seen. I think it has happened because the U.S. literally empowered the Taliban and gave them legitimacy and signed a deal with them as though they are government in waiting. And your point, you know, everyone have a right to claim asylum. It is enriched in, in, in international law, in the G Geneva Convention and humanitarian law. Me sitting here in the UK saying, oh, people should not come, that's not right, that's not moral. So if pe people make their own choices, their, their own decisions, it's very difficult to say how... These are difficult choices. But, but you know, do, people do you don't understand take the choices the... lightly. Gawali, sorry to interrupt you. Do you understand the misgivings that some people have? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's quite unfortunate. And it's unfair. If people want to leave, they should be able to leave. Anyone, as I said, everyone have a right to claim asylum and enjoy in other countries. That's that's the basic of the humanitarian law when it comes to asylum and protection. We can't say, oh, certain people are more deserving or less deserving of the, than others. People make their own choices. Nobody wants but, but, to but leave equally, if they do, have a do choice. Do not other people have the right to say we don't like that idea? I mean, we could, we could have that discussion, but then we live in a world where we all have moral and legal obligations. The UN Convention and other international law are there for, for a reason. It's not about liking and disliking. So, for example, the Afghan doesn't like the Taliban, but they've been imposed upon us. It's not something that we chose. Who voted for the Taliban? Who gives them the legitimacy and empowerment? So the US and the, the UK and the international community not only have a moral and legal obligation, but they owe it to the Afghans because of their actions and inaction in the last 20 years or recently in the last year or so. Ahmed Shah, I notice you... You say you believe the Taliban has changed in the last 20 years. Um, other than on the surface, which is all we've been able to see so far, give us your reasons for those thoughts. Um, given that it flies in the face of what an awful lot of people in Afghanistan think at the moment, because they are trying to get out. Well, the, poli the Taliban's politics and strategy has changed. Their ideology has never changed. Their ideology and, and what they really want deep down, the Islamic Emirate, and their own so-called jihad or their own perception of Islam, that has never changed. Uh, right now, the Taliban are engaged in a, in a, in a dirty war of politics, or I, I call it psychological warfare. They're just trying to uh, get the international recognition and get legitimized, and they're just engaged in this so, game. So they've put on a new set of clothes, but they haven't changed underneath, I think, is, is what you're saying. So when it comes to somebody such as your sister, and, and I, I know she works for an international aid agency, I won't name which one it is, um, if she asked to get out, should she be given special permission because she might not believe the Taliban have really changed? I think, you know, I, I agree. You know, yes, everyone should be able to give the right to leave. You know, this their right, as, as you know, guests mentioned, they're conventional, they're international. Every person has that right, yes. And I'm really thankful to the United States Marines and the United States Armed Forces. Yes, my family is safe and... Uh, 
and it, and the, because of the evacuation plan, it has been delayed. It was really hard. But you know, I want every family who are stuck at that airport, who are outside those airport, who are eligible to be safe. Is, think, is it at all feasible, given the fact that we've only seen maybe uh, twenty to thirty thousand out out so far? Maybe not even that that many. Is it feasible to get them out of the country? With the current plan, with, with no. With the current plan, it's impossible. And August 31st, which is the deadline that the U.S. have assigned, or made a deal with the Taliban to, you know, give them until August 31st, it's impossible. There has to be a new strategy how to isolate people who are eligible and how to get them inside the airport. Right now, U.S. citizens, Canadians, British citizens, these people are stuck outside among the crowd, and these special ops, you are unable to go and get them among the crowd. So it's a total chaos. All the gates are closed. And, we, and they have no idea how this whole thing is going to work. So the current strategy, the current operation is a, uh, it's a failure. It's not working. No, it's impossible. Yeah, yeah OK. Um, Steve, let me come to you. And um, we'll hear from the European Commission President, Ursa von der Leyen. This was when she arrived in Spain on the 21st of August, as all this was unravelling. It is our moral responsibility. And not only to help the Afghans arriving here in Spain, but also those who have remained in Afghanistan. And here I want to emphasize that the European Union is firmly committed to continue supporting the NGOs operating in the country. Humanitarian needs are increasing with the latest development. Um, if we look at the number of internally displaced people, it's the largest number, it's 3.7 million almost, and 80% of them are women and girls and children, and they are the most at risk. So we must help ensure that displaced Afghans can safely return to their homes or have at least a perspective whether they are currently in Afghanistan or in the neighboring countries. So, Steve, what I want to ask you is, she says something about moral responsibility. There we've talked about the numbers and the difficulties, but I want to get your estimation of how many refugees, how many migrants do you think Europe could cope with? I think it's very difficult to put an exact number. What I would say is that whatever happens, we know, as already been described, that the larger number will in fact stay in the region as well. So it, it's, it's fantasy for Europe to suggest that somehow they're, they're doing the, the hardest work on this. We also know repeatedly that those who have arrived in other countries have then been of huge benefit to those societies um, again and again and again. So I think in a sense, it's, the question is, it can also be a different one and this of Decision making is part of what is permitted under the UN um, Refugee Convention. But what is also very clear, and it's actually central to the UN Refugee Convention, which turned 70 this year, it was agreed in 1951 in the aftermath of the Second World War. And central to that convention is the idea that it doesn't matter how you arrive in a country, it's why you are there and why you are seeking asylum. And you have to make the case of this is why I need to have asylum from where I was because it was so dangerous, because I was repressed, or for the clients of freedom from torture and have been tortured and suffered horrifically at the hands of the Taliban, including many of those our clients who have been torture survivors, um, have been tortured precisely because they have helped um, coalition forces very often. And what I think is the deepest hypocrisy is if you have a government which on the one hand praises the UN Refugee Convention and at the same time tries to basically drive a coach and horses through the central element of that convention. The UN Refugee Agency has expressed deep concern about what's happening. Freedom from torture commissioned uh, an, an authoritative legal opinion from the most distinguished lawyers on these issues, which was absolutely clear. It was in conflict with the basic rationale. And I think this is the real trouble, is when a narrative is created that somehow turns people, they can see the chaos that we're seeing in Kabul airport and, and elsewhere. That is the reality of repression and civil war is chaos is... Well, is, the, the reality is, also and is... the idea that everyone will have paperwork is simply fantasy and it's hypocrisy for any government. The reality it. also is, and I'll come to you, Gulwali, on this, is that it's going to be much more difficult in many ways to help those people that you had been helping up until now. As a former refugee, you were helping people who were trying to flee persecution. It's not going to be as simple as it was, not that I'm saying it was simple, but it isn't going to be as easy as it, as it has been. Indeed, it hasn't been easy. I mean, we, there's been increase every year by the displaced people. There are about 80 million displaced. It's only going to rise. And it's difficult because countries like the UK, 
coming up with this anti-refugee bill, penalizing and criminalizing refugees for seeking asylum, coming here through irregular routes when there aren't many safe and legal routes. I mean, this is the first time the UK said they will resettle uh, 20,000 or so Afghans. They never, I mean, they only done it with the Syrians before. And there are very limited ways, safe passage to come here. So yes, it's going to be difficult, especially when you see, you know, Greece building a wall with Turkey and Turkey building a wall with Iran. Every country is kind of passing on the responsibility. The UK doesn't want them. France doesn't want them. Italy doesn't want refugees. Like, where are these people supposed to go? And uh, it's just like the people want to come here because, you know, they, for their safety, for their f better future. And, of course, a lot of Afghans would not have left if the situation was not dire as it is. If perhaps there was a, a permanent ceasefire, if things were done and there was a, some sort of share, power-sharing agreement. The U.S. basically left in giving the Taliban whatever they were asking for. Now the U.S. have as a consequences, and the UK went along with it, and the NATO countries now need to take these refugees. And I'm suggesting about a million should be token, taken by the European Union and about 100,000 by the UK. That's quite a reasonable ask. And the rest, um, you know, neighboring countries to Afghanistan needs to be pressured by the UN, by the international community to open its border because people need to escape. This well, is, it's the, serious, it's urgent. Steve, I want to put to you something that you mentioned to our producers, and that is that you think there has been a sea change, sorry for the, the use of words, um, in the European countries' approach to refugees since the body of that small boy, Alan Kurdi, uh, was found in the ocean. You think there is more empathy now? And apologies once again for saying a sea change. Uh, there certainly was empathy, and it was most remarkable, that terrible image that, that we all remember of, of the boy washed up and... There was, if you like, a global sense of this is horrific and something needs to happen. And um, it was referenced earlier, the UK actually launched a scheme then in order to take more Syrian refugees in as a, as a direct result of that. What I fear is that we have partly lost that, or the government has lost that. I actually think that they underestimate the degree of empathy amongst um, uh, amongst British citizens themselves. The opinion polling is, is clear that people do want to help those who are in most distress. What is difficult is when government create a narrative, this is a bunch of potential criminals or a bunch of potential drug smugglers or a bunch of other dangerous things, and create a sense of danger instead of understanding the humanity of, like, why are people taking these incredible risks across first the Mediterranean and then that short stretch of water separating France and, and Britain? It's because they're in desperate circumstances. And I think that's something which governments seem very, very reluctant to acknowledge. Yes. I really hope that governments will also wake up. We heard you quoted it, or of underlying and quite rightly talking about the moral responsibility. And I hope that perhaps what we are seeing, the terrible scenes of recent days, will reawaken some of that um, in governments as well. And above all, as I say, realizing this is a global issue, that simply pushing it all to somebody else is not going to be helpful, okay. neither in the short term Thank nor you. in the long term. Thank you very much. Gawali, let me ask you this. There will be many people who, once they get out, will be as frightened of coming to a new land as perhaps they were of staying in their homeland. Um, what kind of reception did you get? What kind of fears did you have arriving in Britain? And, and what is your view now on the way that refugees, migrants are accepted in what you now call your home country because you're a British passport holder? Uh, David, I never, you know, I never wanted to leave home. If I had a choice, I want to be with my loved ones. And that's the case for most Afghans, most other refugees in the world. When I arrived to the UK, it took me about 12,000 miles. I went through about 10 countries where I was in prison and welcome treated as a criminal. When I go to the UK, I, I got here because my brother was supposedly here. Um, I was unwelcomed by the system. I was, again, treated as a criminal, as, as a suspect. Um, my nationality was disputed. My uh, age was disputed by social services and the immigration authorities. The people valued me. People welcomed me, but the system did not. And I was hoping things will improve. But unfortunately, in the last 13, 14 years since I've been in Britain, things have only got worse. And that's, uh, that's just heartbreaking. Um, you know, that uh, things has not improved. But I had had the opportunity to go to university, to get a degree, to do a master, write the book, travel the world. That has all been, been, been possible because I've been in the UK. And yes, I understand when new Afghans or new refugees come to a strange new land, it's diff difficult, you know, the, the obstacles, the challenges with language, with understanding the culture, the weather. There's, there's so many different, uh, you know, um, challenges for, for these new arrivals. But uh, there are a lot of good people uh, across the UK and Europe who will be there to welcome them and make them feel uh, at home and support them in whatever way they can. So I've seen a lot of uh, generosity. I travel across Britain, I travel across Europe, and I see there are a lot of great people, um, kind people, kind-hearted people who wants to do the right thing, who wants to host refugees, who wants to provide them with the basic necessity on the and welcome hand, them. On the other hand, let me just put this one, because we've only got about a minute to go. It would be a foolish country, a foolish continent that opened its doors to everyone without some degree 
of suspicion, surely. Sure, I'm not saying that. Of course, there is there is processes and procedures. I'm not saying we should not go through these processes and procedures, but we should not, you know, brush everyone with the same brush and see them as a threat to refugees. We should not fear refugees. These are people who are fleeing violence, persecution, and injustices. If, if they want wars and persecutions, they wouldn't be leaving. They would be staying in their own countries with their own families. People leave because of extraordinary circumstances. We need to give people the benefits of the doubt, not look at people, you know, uh, fearing them because they're different, because they're, you know, this othering is very um, dangerous. And so, yes, I'm not saying it will be great if Europe opens its board, but that's not that's not going to happen. But it should have a, a limited access for people uh, to claim asylum. It should not have, you know, pushbacks in, in Croatia, okay, in Greece and elsewhere and allow people to, uh, to you know, to, to have their, their say. Thank you. Their thank you. I'm sorry to have to shut you up. It's always a delight to talk to you. Steve, thank you very much indeed. And Ahmed Shah in Washington, D.C., much appreciated. And the same sentiment to you wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable. Thank you. We hope to have your company next time. Until then, from me, David Foster, and the Roundtable team, goodbye.